Welcome to you all, dear Rea colleagues and friends. One of the good things that COVID-19 has brought us is to be able to meet and have conversations across different time zones. And in this meeting, Professor Tracy Lamont, Professor in Religious Education with a specialization in Young Adult Ministry, Professor Lamont will introduce to us the work of an Rea ancestor, Dr. Kathleen Gorman. For Professor Lamont, Dr. Kathleen Gorman is an example of good practice of a mentor being an ancestor in the way she makes use of the wisdom of previous generations of ancestors and develops transformative religious education for the next generation. And all she did, it seems, is dreaming, telling stories, and listen to other stories that come together in a process of co-creating innovative, innovative curricula. Then Professor Abraham Rabinovich is a teacher at Fordham University, and his main interest is in the interplay of education and identity formation. Today, Professor Rabinovich introduces to us the work of another ancestor, John Dewey. Although Dewey's name primarily is connected with innovative education in general, he introduced and described extensively experiential learning. Dewey also published his ideas on religious education. And Professor Rabinovich will present his reading of Dewey's view on democracy and the influence on religion in and education and in particular Jewish religious education in the United States, living in two worlds, the Jewish community and the American society. And then last but, le but not least, the floor is open to Professor Mary Elizabeth Moore. Professor Mary Elizabeth Moore is Dean Emerita and Professor of Theology and Education, Boston University School of Theology. Gratitude is the focus in her work these days, motivated by her worries about climate issues and in what looks like the impossibility to live in peace together in difference. Gratitude emerging from feelings of loss. Gratitude as a fertile soil for becoming a good ancestor. Professor Elizabeth Moore will guide us in an interactive workshop on gratitude and reflection thereupon through poetry, theological analysis of gratitude and projections of a legacy for future generations. But now we will start with a 10 minutes presentation of Professor Tracy Lamont, followed by 10 minutes question and answers. Professor Lamont, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, so much. And thank you everyone for, for joining us here today. And, and you know, thank you, Ina, for that lovely opening. Um, I'm just gonna, you know, share with you all, you know, the, the, the process that I, Kind of went through in, in with this paper. I was grateful to be with um, Patrick Reyes. I don't know when it was a year ago, whatever it was, when he did that more early morning session, my time zone, um, of the kind of brainstorming that poem that we created for REA. I feel like any time I get a chance to um, be in the presence of Patrick Reyes doing something process oriented, I will be there. I love his gift of process, um, and so I was I was thrilled to be there. And so as I was thinking about, you know, the call for papers, I just kept coming back to um, Dr. Kathleen O'Gorman. I came to the Loyola Institute for Ministry at Loyola, New Orleans in 2016, um, the fall of 2016. And as a quick backdrop to that, um, you know, she just, we just, <laughs> my, my, at the time, my, my boss, the former director of LIM, um, Tom, he said, you know, because I had dogs and I was moving by myself first for the first three months while my husband like figured out what to do with our house. We were moving from Florida. And he said, Tom said, you know, well, maybe you should talk to Kathleen. She, she knows things about moving with dogs. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. So I, he gave me her phone number. I called her and, you know, I was in such a stress situation trying to find an apartment in that weekend that I had come here to visit, you know, to, to just try and find a place. It was very close to the start of school, um, like probably had two weeks, you know, to, to find a place and get started and move. And so it was very, very stressful. And so I called her and I said, you know, do you know of any places, you know, that, that take pets or anything like that? I've just, you know, Tom told me to call and she said, well, when are you leaving? I said, I, I leave, you know, this was the night before. I said, I'd leave tomorrow. 
I know, and I haven't really found a place yet. And she goes, well, come over here in the morning before you leave. And so I did, long story short, we just got to know each other. I walked in and a person that, that has um, a lot of animals in her life and, and is grateful for those four-legged friends that um, our plenary speakers spoke about, um, I greeted her dogs before I greeted her. And that was when she realized, um, she said, oh, sh this is a good one. <laughs> And so I share that because I got such inspiration um, from the plenary. What is today? Today is Thursday. So the Tuesday plenary, the kitchen table sharing um, of indigenous wisdom. It was, was I, I just thought of her immediately um, when one of the women, I, mean, I, I forgot to write down names of who said what, um, but one of the women started by, by saying, recognizing the solstice. And I thought, Kathleen recognizes every single solstice and every class that she teaches, every time that she's with somebody. And so, so I'm, I'm just grateful to be able to be in this, this session this, this summer with you all because I'm finding great life um, in what I've been hearing from the other plenaries and other conversations and breakouts in the way that Kathleen has inspired me in my life as an ancestor to me. Um, and so, so I open with this image here of this fire, you know, and... I, because if you had a chance to read my paper, you'll, you would have seen the, the conversation she had while looking at a fire. It wasn't like this, it wasn't on a beach, but this is the picture I chose. She was in her backyard when she lit that fire. Um, and so, but also as I begin, you know, I, I recognize that Kim, I think it was maybe yesterday, last night, Kim Anderson said that, you know, while land acknowledgements are not enough, um, they are something. And I do want to acknowledge and pay tribute to the original inhabitants of the land here where I am in the city of New Orleans. It's a continuation of indigenous trade hub on the Mississippi River known for thousands of years as the Bobocana. Um, the native peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial and the resilient voices of Native Americans remain inseparable parts of our local culture. And so with gratitude and honor, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous nations that have lived and continue to live and thrive here. And as I say that, it calls to my mind, my, my living ancestor right now, Kathleen, um, whenever she's been asked kind of on the fly or whenever it is, will you offer the reflection? Will you offer the prayer? Will you open you know, this session for us if we're ever together at LIM or with students or anything? She always begins with a reflection by giving gratitude to the earth and the universe that sustains it. Um, and so I bring her voice in here now and say that while we recognize our land, this land is held in this earth, that is held in this universe that gave birth to this earth by creation. And so um, in the gravitational pull that keeps us all together, this whole diversity and unity that we have that begins from the universe that she has taught me. Um, and so I will share with you um, what I loved again about these sessions about um, you know, the, the kitchen table conversations. Um, if you look right here, I don't know if you can see my mouse kind of flying around here, um, but you see her table, that's on her back porch, and that's where we have shared every single one of these conversations. And if it's too hot, then we'll be at her dining room table, but we are always sharing a meal together, and we're always sitting at her table. Um, here is Marley and here is Sarah, the two rescue dogs she currently has, um, but her communion of saints go all the way back you know, 20 years, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, when Katrina hit, she had, um, I want to say 12 dogs in her rescue in her house that she had to evacuate with and two cats um, at the time, you know, and so they're, they're her priority in her life. And here she is celebrating my birthday, but she has her Doberman rescue shirt on, which was wonderful. She sang me a song. Um, and I put the images of the live oak trees that we have very close to where she lives in Audubon Park. Um, and the reason I put that picture there is because my inspiration from her has been, you know, I've come at ecology and creation from the perspective of environmental concerns. Um, and that's a very anthropocentric way of coming to these things. She, through her influence from Thomas Berry and from her time at Teachers College Columbia where she got her EDD, you know, with Maxine Gree, learning from Bill Dahl, 
Um, you know, here at LSU, her and Bill Dahl were, were quite close, you know, and he has that whole new science of curriculum development, you know. Um, and so her ancestors, her mentors, you know, and things like that, that come through in the ways, in the communications that she and I have and our conversations that we have, um, you know, and so that, but the, you know, that this, this table here, this house that she's in is where she's hosted these people that she hosted to, the amount of times Thomas Berry was in her house. You know, they were dear, dear friends. And she is the, the one person that brought Thomas Berry to Loyola, New Orleans, um, and brought his impress here and that we can say that with great pride. And she, she shares that with me often. And so I never knew Thomas Berry. I didn't know his work. Um, before I met Kathleen. And so, like I said, I come to things very anthropocentrically, very human-centered, very, you know, oh, climate change is the issue, you know, things like that. And she has cracked open for me in the last six years of knowing her, um, the deep theology of creation that says, it's not about what we do for the earth, how we care for the earth. Um, and again, that's why this tree is here. It's how the earth cares for us. Um, and so that's just that reciprocal relationship is in, and I speak from a particularly a Catholic context, Christian, but mostly Catholic um, in that respect, because most of the Catholics and even Laudato Si that Pope Francis wrote has a very strong anthropocentric context to it. It's very, I don't hear nearly as much of Thomas Berry in that. Um, in, in the way that we are learning from the earth and the way the earth is teaching us, the way the universe is our primary religious educator. I don't hear that in Laudato Si nearly as much as I wish that I did. Um, and so what she taught me, you know, she teaches me all the time through her own examples and that's that phenomenological approach of, of experiential learning. And so when I first got here, I'd walk with her and her dogs in the park and she said, this is how the earth takes care of us. It's so hot so hot in South Louisiana in August. And when you walk in the park, if you walk closer to the oak trees, you feel cool air. They're giving off cool, cooler air around them. The oak trees care for her when she walks her dog in the heat, you know? And I thought to myself, I never once in my life did I think of that, you know? And, and Thomas Berry's work that she shares is this great sense of awe and wonder, the transcendence that we feel with the, the power and magnitude of, of, you know, thousands of different shades of colors in a sunset, you know, and, and that, that our space and our awareness of that means something. It can transcend us from our day-to-day -day lives and it's deeply sacred because of that. And so naming the natural world as a sacred space is something Thomas Berry did and he drew I would say, I mean, nine, you know, 50% from science and 50% from indigenous wi wisdom, you know, for his days. And so he's just naming many things that ancestors before us had already known, but that through colonization and this very Eurocentric, you know, Euro-American, very white context um, is, is trying to be um, rethought again, you know, and, and reclaimed in some way, in sometimes healthy ways, and in other times in still colonializing sort of ways. Um, and so, but it's, but again, so I share these images with you all, and um, we have a project that we started working on um, to honor the work of Thomas Berry through her legacy, through Kathleen's legacy, and I'm grateful she just, and I think it's all right that I say this, um, I am grateful that she, uh, she just turned her, her 80th birthday in May, and she is definitely still with us, and I just joined her Zoom class last night before going to Carl's session on religion and ecology, uh, or education and ecology, um, because Carol Lennox is a graduate of ours, and again, so she's now someone following in Kathleen's footsteps. She has been working on this Berry project and has created a series of retreats using these very profound reflection questions and all the videos that we have of Thomas um, that are just that are just limbs, you know, experiences with him coming here, teaching, um, talking with Kathleen, interviews that she's had with him, and she puts retreats together, and so. And, but she has this excellent process approach to education and, and retreat building as a result of this. And they've been on Zoom the last three years. We had two in person and then the rest we, we pivoted all to Zoom um, and we try to host them around the solstices. Um, and so Carol is her name and she's in North Carolina. 
Um, and that, those are my only slides I have, so I'll stop sharing. I wanted to show you some pictures. Um, but so she's in North Carolina, and she joined the um, Religion and Ecology Chorus Universe as Divine Manifestation um, that, that Kathleen is teaching this summer. So she was a guest, a guest last night in their Zoom class. And so I bring this up because of, of the, the Thomas Berry project that we have here, but also the ways that Kathleen um, has garnered this community around Thomas Berry's work and all of the, but also, you know, some of the things, and I, and I want to leave some, some good time for discussion here, um, but one of the reasons that I lifted her up for this paper and this conversation is, you know, again, I wrote about her impress on me in, in the paper, but she was dismissed by this guild, you know, for years because she was too out there. Hippie was the word back in the 80s and 90s, you know, 80s-ish, um, you know, and and you know things were different in rea back then and so seeing that there's an ecological focus coming back to rea now is wonderful but i raise up her voice as being maybe one of the early voices that said we need to pay attention to creation we need to pay attention to the natural world and our relationship with it um, and so in terms of religious education you know the the three principles that the universe teaches us that Thomas Berry shares is subjectivity, diversity, and communion, you know? And so when we go against those three principles, and if we talk in sort of Catholic original sin sort of language, then we bring sin into the world. When we, when we seek, you know, when we don't want diversity to thrive, when we don't see our interconnectedness and communi communion with all living things, um, and subjectivities. Sorry, I, don't, sorry, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. It's, you are very okay. enthusiastic, but I would like to have the possibility for people to ask you questions. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So can you please so, wind up in a minute? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So um, I will share with you, um, you know, the ways that one last thing is, was her, her story with that fire. And I just sat there writing down everything she was saying. She was standing before this fire. She was trying to tell me about how you know, the way the natural world teaches us as, as a primary religious educator. And she said, think of your discussion boards. You know, I was like, I don't know, do I write too much? You know, my tenure portfolio's up, she's helping me with this and whatever. I said, am I too wordy? You know, I'm an extrovert, this is terrible in writing. I'll just keep writing and talking, you know, as you can all see here. And so, and she says, think of it as this fire I'm standing before. She says, where does the wood come from? Where does the kindling, how does it start? Is there a log that gets thrown on it that push, that squanders it out or does that log keep it going who brings the log where did these things come from is it damp is it dry what is the, does the dampness create a smoke and what is the smoke and i just thought to myself oh my gosh how is she doing this just off the cuff standing in front of a fire she said how is the natural world teaching us how to be better educators and i thought i don't know anyone in my life that's ever spoken like that and ever had the intrinsic knowledge that the natural world is our primary educator religious educator um, so I raise her voice here um, and her impress on me here as my religious educator, one of my many, Bud Harrell, thank you for joining, being one of them as well, who I named in my paper. So, so that's all I'll share. I'll just take, you know, conversation and question here. I could go on for days, as you probably all know. <laughs> yeah, as I understand, because apparently your teacher has, was a very uh, inspiring person for you, your mentor, yeah. Um, well, please, I, I'd like to open the floor now for questions. Whom can I give the floor for a question or a comment or an own experience? Apparently, your presentation and your paper together are very clear and there are no questions at all. Elizabeth has her hand up, I think. Sorry, I didn't see it. Sorry. Elizabeth, please. Uh Tracy, your comment about Kathleen's um, not being accepted by the Guild is very, very interesting to me because um, when she was active in REA, I attended every single session she did because I was fascinated and I was also passionate about that, which she was passionate. And um, I remember the time when she said, I just can't come back here anymore because I don't feel as if the organization's taking seriously my work. So my, my question is here, really more of a question for all of us, and that is um, your report is that the organization rebuffed her. My experience in that moment was that 
she would left the organization because she felt like it wasn't doing what it should be doing. Yeah. So yeah. my question for, for all of us is how do we, as an organization, a community, a people, uphold the values that people, other people, that people lay before us so that we do more than hear and move on. Yeah. What kind of challenge is Kathleen offering to us today in that regard? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. And, and I, you know, I, I, you have a keen sense of who she was and I would say you are spot on in your assessment that, that she, she left the guild in many ways, you know, um, but I, I just, you know, I, I see her every day as, as not gaining traction. You know, it's not, you know, it's just not gaining traction. So where do you put your energy? You know, that kind of thing. And, and so, and I still hear that in her voice today, you know, and that, that was one of the reasons why I chose to write about her as I thought, you know, it, it's, there has to be more documentation of her, you know, and, and her wisdom. But, you know, I think you have an excellent, excellent question that you've raised about how and I've, but I have been seeing in the last five or so years, and, and again, this is just through my eyes, very, very limited eyes, um, you know, that I do, I, I'm grateful for the changes in REA, the, the directions we've been moving in. It's been keeping me very abreast in, in, in new ways, and, it's, and it has been inspiring me. And I'll just share this one thing. Um, you know, I've been coming to REA, not for long, I'm not a long time member, like 2015, 2014, maybe that was one of my first years coming, um, you know, and, and so, but, you know, loving it and everything else. Um, but then I thought, you know, kind of during COVID and then kind of just testing out my research, I thought, well, let me see what, what other guilds are doing. And so I threw myself into a whole bunch of other associations and I stopped, you know, about four or five months ago and I looked at myself and I said, REA, these are still my people. These are my people. This is where I, I feel I'm learning so much more instead of being the one maybe giving, giving the information, you know? So I think that there's, there's great directions addressing that question that you have, you know, Mary, so, so thanks. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we have to um, change the question in how do we allow people with a different voice uh, uh, being a member of REA? And that we listen to, um, I would say, deviant voices, voices that seem very strange to us. But I'd like to give the floor now to um, Dr. Professor Mabici. I don't know whether I pronounced the name right. Because I saw you raised your hand. And then I think it's Chuck. Chester yes. Um, and then I, raised my, I raised my hand. I am Mabici, Father Mabici, Remedius Mabici. You are right. The N is silent. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, um, uh, Dr. Tracy, uh, I wanted to hear you again on the the uh, the comment of your mentor on how the, the the universe teaches us in three ways. I heard about diversity, uh, communion, and something else. I didn't quite get that. And then the this, the the other question I wanted to ask is, uh, um. How do we deal with the disappointments in, in in this? What you have just presented is it by just um, bowing out or staying until we break ground? Mm -hmm. uh, if you have something really important to offer, um, it seems to me a. a we don't always have um, a wonderful reception at first or second or third try. So now that you you have benefited so much from from her, and you can uh, tell us more how much we could have benefited if we have listened. But then, what is the educators? Um, response up i don't want to use the word should is is um bowing out a, a good way of being a a good educator to call attention or staying in and um ruin with the wind so the, 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 however i don't know <laughs> sure 
I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. So <laughs> those two. Uh, uh, Tracy, Tracy, before you start to answer, I'd like to uh, allow Chuck and uh, Katie Weinix to um, give their questions, and then maybe okay. you can give a short answer to the three questions because your time is up. Got it. Got it. <laughs> okay, Chuck, please, your question. I, sure. I had the privilege of meeting uh, Thomas Berry and sitting with him in his house here in Riverdale, New York, and having conversations with him. And I would oftentimes describe the conversation like being at an airport, because so much of what he said went completely over my head. He was so deep. He was so technical. And there's some accessibility issues to his deep thought. So I just wonder, with your own reading, any comments on your understanding of Thomas Berry's work that can sometimes be difficult to grasp because of his, uh, his, his technical and, and depth and um, accessibility to his thoughts? Yeah, and then I, I saw uh, Katie Vinings raising her hand. Um, I, I'll forego it for now. Go ahead, Ina. OK. Thanks a lot. So, Tracy, it's your turn now to give a response to those two questions, but please be short. I will try my best. Um, <laughs> the first question, Father, it was, um, I think you were asking what the three principles were. So subjectivity, yes. subjectivity, communion, and diversity. Subjectivity is that everything has an interiority. Everything has a purpose. Um, nothing is an object. Everything is subject. Um, and so that was, I think, maybe the one that, that didn't. Yes, yes. Well. Thank you. You know, and what you were asking about is maybe it's resilience. You know, one of the things that Kathleen has also talked about, she says, you know, I'll put my energy where it where I can see the difference. And that's with students in limb. You know, um, what I've what I've chosen to do is is take some risks. You know, I, I was at an intercultural celebration, you know, with young adults sponsored by the U.S. Conference of Bishops um, in Chicago about a week or so ago. And they wanted me to speak on unity and diversity. And I said, well, of course, I have to start with Thomas Berry. And I have to start with these three principles. And I have to start with creation. And that's a privileged space as a white person that hasn't had to deal with as much adversity you know, culturally as a lot of my cultural families have that we're sharing in those sessions. And so I had to name all of those things. I said, this is where I come from, but this is why. You know, And, and so maybe it's building up resilience. Maybe it's finding, I don't know that there's a direct answer to that. I think it's every personal struggle that a person has depending on your own experiences and how how you know you've been trying so hard and then maybe it's not taking maybe it's new approaches maybe it's new language which kind of goes to what you're asking chuck about um you know thomas berry so the reason one of the reasons i bring up carol lennox so I'll, I'll come back to her in a second but kathleen made thomas berry accessible that's one of the great things that she did her interviews with him that are still a part of our courses, he's going on and on and on about these principles, right? And, 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 and mumbling also, you know, as Thomas would do. And, you know, and, and, she's, and she just holds his feet to the fire because she is an educator. He was not, you know? And so because of her background in deep, deep education and religious education, she said, but what does this mean for a catechist teaching, you know, the, the New Testament, you know, story of Jesus? And he evades and he tries and he gives some big answer again. She goes, no, you didn't answer my question. And she finally gets him to. So she, in the way that she writes about him, she made him more accessible. And so his language is challenging for our students. Very often goes over their heads like the great work is a hard one for some of them. But then Carol Lennox has done this too. And so she has created these snippets. And I said this to Carol last night. There was one of the times, you know, that, that he was saying, in one of his videos, he's like, it's not reduce, reuse, and recycle. It's not it. It's a whole shift in your mindset. And that's Laudato C has a lot of that language too. You know, and for whatever reason, there was something else that he was saying in that video. And the way she asked us to reflect on that in our personal lives in the Barry retreat we just had last year, I thought to my, and I said to her, I said, I've been reading Barry for years and I didn't get that. You know, like, so, she, so, so I think it's the religious educator's job to make challenging complex texts like Barry accessible to others. And I've, I've witnessed Kathleen do that. And one of her dear protégés, you know, Carol Lennox has done it as well. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your very enthusiastic presentation. <laughs> I, really you. Must, you so I really must start reading, uh, reading your mentors, the, main, the names you mentioned. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, but for time reasons, we have to uh, make it short. Uh, and I'd like to invite Professor Abraham Rabinovich to introduce us to the reading of Dewey. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
I just want to make one correction at this point. I'm uh, not teaching at Fordham. I'm just an independent researcher and lecturer. So, but uh, to be uh, okay. Full disclosure. Uh, I would like to begin with two powerful words in the Hebrew, which, according to the Jewish tradition, one order uh, supposed to order those the words every morning before even opening our eyes. These words are mode ani. I am grateful for the blessings of a new day and what it could bring along. I invite you to repeat after me those magical words in the Hebrew, modeh, ani, let us be grateful at all times. I'm grateful for the RRA leadership for arranging this beautiful conference. I'm grateful for my esteemed uh, presenters, Tracy and Mary, and for our mo moderator, Ina, and for all particip participating in our media gathering. Special gratitude to my advisor and mentors of my dissertation, which this research is part of, Professor Butterell, who is joining us today, and Kieran Scott, the Fordham School of Religious Education, yay. My paper is strictly academic rather than practical. Instead of dwelling on the meaning of gratitude or how to express gratitude, which Mary will demonstrate to us shortly in our gratitude workshop, which I can't wait for, I will present that uh, this paper presents a historical outline about the ancestors who impacted our lives and religious education in America in the last century. This paper, uh, I will present a summary, assuming that you've read the, my paper or you take the time to read it in the future. So this uh, article presents uh, newly research about John Dewey, born in 1859 and passed in 1952. He was a giant in his own way, American philosopher, educator, and leader of the progressive movement of education in the United States. Uh, this article explores how Dewey helped shape a reform education in the United States during the early decade of the 20th century. De Dewey also was the keynote address speaker at the first REA, REA conference in Chicago in 1903. Although he shied away from being directly involved with religious education. Mm -hmm. Many of his ideas had a positive influence upon religious education theory and practice. Uh, this paper focuses on examining the historical impact Dewey had on the development of progressive Jewish education mm -hmm. in the early 20th century. It argues that Dewey, Dewey played a major role in influencing Jewish educational leaders of that time in developing and implementing a democratic progressive Jewish education. Most importantly, this paper examines how Dewey's educational theories contribute towards mm -hmm. a new transformation of American Jewish identity in the early 20th century. I'd like to emphasize that while Jewish education, especially youth education, has been around for millennia, uh, the most sacred prayer in our tradition is called the Shema prayer, commands us to instruct our children on a daily basis. Over the course of history, uh, Jewish religious education has expanded. However, this is beyond the scope of this paper to address the history and the development of Jewish religious education through the ages. But I would like to point out that this progressive development of Jewish education influenced by, Jew by Dewey is very unique because Jewish education was very insular and Jewishly focused for thousands of years. And I'm very grateful for this unique revelation in Jewish education and adopting an adaptation of openness to socialization that occurred in the turn of the century with the influence of John Dewey. This paper, while its headline addresses John Dewey, it also acknowledges the great, my great gratitude towards Dr. Samson 
Benderley, born 1876, and passed July 9th, 1944. And his disciples who have dedicated their lives, many disciples who have dedicated their lives to change Jewish education in America by establishing a platform for furthering and improving Jewish education in America to become more pluralistic and integrate. However, they could have not reached their goals without the intellectual instructions and guidance of Dewey, who ironically was on the other side because he was not even a Jewish ancestor. But to them, and it helped them integrate into American society while maintaining a Jewish identity. Interesting to point out that unlike the, cat, the, the Catholic diocese who fought hard to establish the parochial schools in America, and they saw the integration with Americanism as a major threat. Benderly and his followers, with the help of Dewey, have embraced the public school system and developed a, a Jewish edu religious education, integrative Jewish religious education, where Jewish students would study several hours daily religious ed in addition to the public school. So in a way, they opposed the whole parochial school system. Uh, I also want to make a note about uh, to express further gratitude for Benderly and his devotion to the religious education. Benderly was actually born in Palestine and, uh, and studied medicine in Egypt and then came to America to study medicine to continue his studies in medicine in John Hopkins University. But while he was here, he realized that there's a lack of religious educators. So he devoted himself to teaching youth, religious youth education. And he was caught by the board of uh, the hospital. And from the records of the board, there was a discussion that he was given an ultimatum that he must stop using their facility and the time of doing medicine to teach religious education, or otherwise he will be expelled. And he chose to continue be being a religious educator. That's how brave he was. And the words he said is that I quote, the doctors healed the body. I, I chose to be a religious educator doctor and I wanna heal souls. So how brave of him, how grateful we should be towards him. Um, uh, I ex this paper also explores the writing of many Benderly students who played a major role in shaping Jewish education in America. And it shows how their works are linked directly to Dewey's teaching ends and principles. Uh, the pa this paper hones in on three of his major students who worked in religious, Jewish religious education and has published many works and and religious education. First one is Isaac Bergson from 1892 to 1975, who served as supervisor of School of Ex uh, Extension Activities of the Bureau of Jewish Education and former co-founder and director of the Central Jewish Institute, which was an integrative school system. Emmanuel Gorman, uh, one of Bendeley's uh, students himself, who later became religious educator guru for the Reform Judaism in the United States, a master curriculum writer who spent his entire career as director of education in the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. And finally, Dr. Alexander Dushkin, who succeeded Benderly in leading the, the Bureau of Jewish Education in New York until he immigrated to Israel in 1949 and helped found the John Dewey School of Education in Jerusalem. Um, I don't know how much time I have, you know. I can't hear you. What? One more minute, please. Oh, one more minute. Okay, then I have to skip. Um, there is some special, uh, the Jewish students who studied and uh, uh, Columbia, and there was a dual program and uh, somehow felt very close with it, uh, 
do do his ideas about education in general, which I point out in this paper, and most importantly, do his ideas of integrating the individual and the society together, which is something that helped them reshape and refine their uh, formation of a new American Jewish education and American Jewish identity. And uh, I was going to read the conclusion, but I'll leave it. Uh, I would just like to conclude with gratitude to our ancestors. But I want to point out that this paper demonstrates how sometimes our ancestors could be from different religions or non affiliated as well with our religion or atheist or of any kind. But they surely could have impacted us and enriched our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. And it's very kind of you that you keep to the 10 minutes because now there's time for questions from, from the other people. So please, who has a question about Jewy and Jewish religious education? Whom can I give the floor? Well, if there is no question, I would like to ask you a question because I think there is really a tension between this individual and society and a tension between being a member of a Jewish community and living in an American society. And I wonder, could you please elaborate a bit more on this Jewish American identity formation? Oh, uh, this is a very loaded question. Thank you for, <laughs> for raising this question. I think it's an ongoing process and uh, that's a whole study on itself. Uh, uh, you know, Jews uh, have struggled with it in many forms, in many ways. And of course, the Jewish, different Jewish denominations dealt with that question differently. Of course, Reform Judaism is more adoptive and more assimilating versus Conservative Judaism, which is slightly adoptive. And the Orthodox are very similar to the Catholics. They did not want to have anything to do with the public school system and they created parochial school systems because they felt there was a threat and they felt that you know the melting pot of america is going to th threaten their jewish identity yeah. they fought very hard for it but this is a very interesting development that um the vision of benderly and his disciples who believe that you could integrate both. And, um, and they took the philosophy of, you know, Dewey was not a theologian. Dewey was strictly a philosopher and developed theories of democracy of education, which is, is probably one of his greatest works. And um, they took those theories of philosophy and try to implement them to uh, within somehow combine a find a balance between being Jewish and being open and accepting the American identity. So in a way to create, in a way they created a new identity like a Jewish slash American identity, which uh, which is a which is a great contribution which they wanted to implement and in a way it still exists this uh identity but um in a way it was lost because it was also criticized that with too much assimilation uh from his side and so forth but uh it's not uh, my the best way to answer it this is an ongoing development and uh now we're in 21st century this even goes to a much new level of how to develop this new, how to refine ourselves as a really Jewish and an American identity. And I'm sure other scholars here on the panel or, or are participating could uh, share how it plays in within Christian slash American identity, which we all struggle with. <laughs> 
Yes. Yeah, and there is a kind of similarity with, um, say, we in the Netherlands with Moroccan Dutch identity or Turkish Dutch identity is this kind of hybrid identities that, well, that gives some tensions but has some beautiful challenges as well. Right. Um, I see there is a comment in the chat. Okay, that's the title of a book. We need not go into Yeah, that. but uh, I, I just want to make a note that Jonathan yeah. Krasner actually, uh, he wrote a lot on Benderly. And yeah. you both, so yeah, so thank yeah, you. Thanks. Thank you, Chuck, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, if there are no more questions on comments, I'm trying to see if somebody raised his or her hand, no. Maybe you want to make some concluding remarks? Um, I'm, I'm fine. I see somebody here uh, wrote something. Uh, say a bit more about this program education. Um, um, I'm not sure I understand the question, uh, Gabriel. Uh, Maybe Gabriel can come in and, and elaborate a bit on the question. Where is Gabriel? Okay. I, I, I see him, but I, I don't see him. I, I mean, he's- yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, Abe, I was interested in um, the reception of RE, religious education, in other contexts. So when you mentioned that a, um, uh, a religious educator, I forgot the name, you mentioned was- Benderly, right. Dr. Benderly, yeah. Yeah, Benderly was doing that in the, you know, I know you're a chaplain, so he was doing that in the hospital and the pushback he got. So right. I, I was wondering what kind of religious education was doing. Was this exactly Jewish religious education? Of okay. course, not the type we do now, interdenominational or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a very good question. Yeah, I should clarify that, uh, Gabriel, because um, his, his role of uh, religious education that he took upon himself was strictly with youth. He was basically teaching youth education, but he was using the facility of the hospital, I guess. But it had nothing to do with any chaplaincy work or anything to do with the hospital. Uh, that was not his uh, role. He was a student in medicine and just decided, you know, it was a lack of uh, Jewish uh, educators. I'm going to teach the youth. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very brave of him, but the hospital did not go for that. And uh, you know, you. administration, yes. Respectively. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I would. I can't wait for Mary's workshop on gratitude. So. Uh, well, and I, I, I yeah. think that uh, both presentations from Tracy and from you prepared us for the workshop of uh, Mary Elizabeth Moore. So please, Mary Elizabeth, I would like to give the floor to you. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, extremely grateful and I'm going to share screen now. Can you see that well? Yes, perfect, thank you. Very good. Um, the focus of this workshop actually is going to include some framing, uh, but I, I, I would like for you to have an opportunity to pause at four different points to do some reflection internally. So if you would like to have a piece of paper or a, 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 a document open on your computer for some writing, I invite you to do that. If not, you are welcome to do this silently. Uh, the focus is on gratitude, forebears and future bears. Gratitude um, is, is a phenomenon, a posture that takes place that is filled with joy and harm and resilience. All of us inherit some of each. Uh, but we also, uh, some people inherit a great deal of harm. 
and others a great deal of resilience. So we need to recognize the diversity of our inheritance. Uh, gratitude is a gift that can arise in the hardest of times and can be claimed. It's also a posture that's shaped by decisions. So it is not something that happens magically in our lives, although sometimes we can be overwhelmed by it, but it often is something that we have to um, develop with great intentionality. So I begin with a proposal. The postures and practices of gratitude are pathways for honoring the dignity of our forebears, which includes human ancestors, lands, and creatures, and for building a future in which our children and grandchildren, together with the earth, can thrive. And I'm, I make a case that becoming a good ancestor is grounded in gratitude for God, for those people and trees and mountains who have gone before, and for all who will come in the future. Uh, in, in, in this work, I'm following in the spirit of indigenous peoples, healers, and religious leaders such as Thich Nhat Hanh. We'll be focusing on four aspects of gratitude, God, ancestors, resilience, and new generations. I have some of the framing on the screen but I want you to be aware that um, I'm not going to read everything that's on the screen. I, I, in terms of gratitude for the movements of God, I want to highlight the Jewish tradition, especially because of what Abe has already shared with us. Um, the Hebrew word for Jewish people is Yehudim, uh, which derives from Judah, Yehuda, which derives from the Hebrew word Yada, meaning to give thanks. So thank Thanksgiving is foundational to Jewish identity and life practices. Hopefully, Abe will correct me if I get any of this wrong after we uh, close here. Um, but he has already referred us to the Jewish morning prayers, which open with giving thanks to God for a new day and for God's faithfulness. You find similar accents in Christian and Muslim traditions. So I am going to share. Um, a couple of poems with you uh, that are selected from my paper. And I invite you simply to take a deep breath and to receive these as offerings. And then I'm going to ask you to meditate on your own gratitude toward the holy, toward that which you name as holy. Wandering wild and wandering deep. Come wander with me and wonder in the holy mysteries of life. Opening the soul. In luminous stars and fields of peaches and peas, Rocky canyon walls, mountain streams, schools of tuna swimming in the sea, pods of whale, pods of whales, a robin's nest above our door. The numinous beckons to my soul. I invite you now to reflect silently and perhaps in the form of prayer. your gratitude for the holy. Amen. I invite you to share um, just 
unmute yourself and share single words and phrases that emerged for you as you meditated on gratitude for the holy. So much to be grateful for. All we have, we have received. There are gifts. Grateful grateful for the holiness and wholeness of the whole wide world. So much I have forgotten. We'll move to the next, um, the next theme, which is gratitude for ancestors. And here I'll call attention to one um, to, to one of the sources that is framing this section, and that's Howard Thurman, who, when he wrote Jesus and the Disinherited, was writing to people who have their backs against the wall. And he asked what the teachings and life of Jesus have to say to the poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed. He sought to honor the ancestry of Jesus and the ancestry of his African-American people who lived with the ravages of racism. I'll also call attention to Robin Wall Kimmerer and dozens of other indigenous authors who speak of gratitude for their ancestors and for the land in which they live. In her case, the land of pecan trees, waters, and black ash. Mama, do you remember? In my earliest memory, I stood by you as you hung the wash with wooden pins on the line beside our home, where white sheets waved in thick Louisiana air. I still see little me watching, helping, feeling warm. Mama, do you remember our summer trips to the Gulf? Living a week in Biloxi in a small hotel, motel, filling a cooler each day with tuna fish, oranges, saltine crackers, yummy lunch beneath a big umbrella on the sand. Do you remember when we flew to the Arizona desert years after on your 50th anniversary, four years to the day after daddy died? I remember it at all. Why do I so often recall your disappointment in me? Your regret that I was shyer and far less a lady than you had hoped. Beneath the clothesline, on the beach, in the desert, you were awash with love, and I soaked in it. I will share with you here before I pause for you to reflect that one of my other poems, which is in the paper, is um, it's called Little River. And it is a thanksgiving for a river as ancestor. I invite you now to silence, breathe deeply, and recall moments with your ancestors, human. Trees, seas, skies, creatures, all.
again, I'll pause briefly and invite anyone in single words and phrases to name some of these ancestors. Jesus. My grandmother, Margaret, whom I never met because I wasn't born before she passed on. Sticky love. With honor to all those named and unnamed, we move to the next aspect of gratitude for resilience. Resilience is the capacity to face legacies of suffering and injustice honestly, and to make a path toward recovery and reparations. Resilience emerges forthrightly from facing the horrors that our ancestors endured and are perpetuated and searching for new paths towards survival and well-being. And here I share a poem that was born out of my Southern ancestry. Um, and one of the most important people in my life about whom I've written in other places as well is Mary, Mary Ann Wong who cared for me during the day when my mother and father were both out. I confess, growing up with Mary shaped me as a person far more sensitive than I would otherwise have been. A person who could love and giggle and dash to bed when my parents came home early. I thought Mary's race was less than mine, though I always knew she was better than me. The racist structures we enacted were strengthened by my family's participation. I did not condemn those structures with anything more than a few probing questions for a few moments at a time. White supremacy shaped me in my very own home, even as I wholeheartedly loved Mary and was powerfully shaped by her love for me and by the deep black culture she taught me to value as if it were my own. My white supremacy emerged in the same childhood that taught me to resist. Slowly, ever so slowly in early years, but bursting ever more boldly as I grew, though I have not and never will be free of the taint, even as I never will stop trying. Pause and take some time to reflect on the resilience in your own ancestors and in yourself. And this time we will not share after, but I invite you to breathe deeply and remember. Amen.
And we turn now to the last form of gratitude for this presentation, and that is gratitude for new generations. I'll take time to read a quote from Vanessa Nakate, a young climate activist in Uganda, who speaks of the value and the challenges of new generations. Change is already happening. My children and grandchildren will grow up on a radically different planet. Their realities and the choices they'll be able to make will be different from ours. And unless we act now, their options are likely to be much worse and fewer. We're fighting for our lives, for the lives to come. And so I turn to those for whom for whom's, whose lives I fight. I'll share two poems here. The first is one I wrote short, shortly after I retired, um, turning a page into retirement, actually shortly after I stepped out of the deanship, which was before I retired. The time has come to let go, to know that others will carry on and will do it better than Made possible, yes, by what I have done, seen and unseen, but stretching wider, going deeper, building strength, spreading compassion, multiplying wisdom, grounded, always grounded in daring pasts, guided by the power of prophetic visions, generating justice. How good it is to let go to let the world continue to spin without me, to dwell in the moment, the fullness of emptiness, the trust in others, the calling of silence, the new beginnings that break out from my broken, open heart. And finally, my students and former students, are beacons of light, the reasons I never despair, of a future beyond hope, without care, without movements toward justice and repair. And I invite you to take 15 seconds this time to reflect on the future generations for whom you are grateful and for whom you give yourself. And in my last three sec three seconds, I asked, oh, it's no, no more three seconds. Uh, for whom and what are you grateful? Thank you for participating. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much, Mary Elizabeth. Very much. I really appreciate it very much that you uh, that you kind of force us to be silent and to reflect. Thank you so much. I would like to open the floor now for people who would like to share their experience with this kind of, well, it's not a presentation, this kind of meditation through Zoom. It's very special. Zoom would like and I, I used up my whole time uh, with, the, with the workshop. So please don't, um, don't feel like you need to take time for discussion of it. I'll leave that to you, Ina. Yeah, well, I would say your your, presenta your presentation is not something for discussing, but for sharing experiences. So I would like to, uh, I I'd invite people to share their experiences. I would like to share something. Please, come in. I appreciate being able to reflect and share the things that I was grateful for. But when it came to... <sighs> When I was forced to be silent on the ancestors of resilience, I was, it reminded me of the silence of my ancestors. 
I wasn't able to name those who survived the transatlantic slave trade and US chattel slavery. So in the same way they have been silenced, I was silenced and that was hurtful. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to share an experience? Nice. And if not, it's fine. I mean, I for myself, when I share my experience, I need silence now to reflect upon what happens in my mind and in my heart when I had to reflect upon my ancestors, the silent voices, the, well, everything you touched upon, Mary Elizabeth. Thank you. We had a clothesline in my backyard where we used to hang clothes and let the wind dry them and blow the sheets and the wooden, the wooden uh, pins um, were used to clip the sheets and the clothes. Coming from a family of 12, my mom would have a lot of laundry to do hanging on these very long clotheslines with the clothespins. You know, there's wonderful wooden clothespins that were used to, to do that job. So that poem brought back those images of that backyard clothesline that we had. And just the wisdom of having an attitude of gratitude on a daily basis and to do a gratitude inventory. I used to do that with my students. We would do two minutes silent meditation followed up with asking them to think of 10 things they were grateful for. And over time, I would do it so quickly using my fingers. It became something that was just a very quick um, recitation of those 10 things I was grateful for that I would repeat over and over again, becoming so familiar with them. Uh, and so it's just such a, a, a piece of wisdom to just have that attitude of gratitude and to invite people to think about what they're grateful for. It oftentimes can be an antidote to, to depression or when things seem really bad, uh, to think about what is it that you're grateful for? Or what is it that you have? You may want something, you may miss something, you may be suffering, but what can you still be, be grateful for? Uh, so thank you for that. Um, exercise of gratitude and, and your poems. Mm -hmm. Somebody else? Ina, I would like to respond um, briefly to Barbara, if mm -hmm. I might. Mm -hmm, sure. Barbara, I'm so grateful to you for sharing what you did. And um, because Gratitude is a, a posture that is a gift and a decision. It is not something that is filled with joy all the time. And, and this was a mini workshop, very compressed. But what you named is so incredibly important. And it requires, if we really are going to allow ourselves to be filled with gratitude, we have to take time. And we have to mourn and express deep anger and hurt. So I want to say thank you for doing that here, even though you had to do it briefly. Thank you. Thank you, um, because I do pray and thank God for my ancestors. And so I was grateful because I believe they prayed for me as I pray for future generations. And so I would have been happy to name that. And um, I would like to add to this um, that gratitude can also be a very sad thing. For example, um, and, and it, it emerges from longing for something. Uh, and at this very moment, I long so much for being together in one place, holding each other's hands and share these experiences with each other. But I'm very grateful that we had these moments years ago. And I 
hope and pray for it. I'm sure we will have these moments again. And I think we must be grateful that we can have these moments now through Zoom, though it feels a bit like secondhand, but it's still there, you know, we still, I still have a very strong feeling of togetherness at this moment. Thank you so much. Oh, I, I see Bud's hand. I don't know where we are with time. Sorry, I can't, I couldn't see it. Please come in. Um, I just wanted to say a word of gratitude for um, Mary herself. I, and when she asked what to be grateful for, I thought of the various times over the years that I've heard her present at the REA. Uh, I've also thought about a few conversations that I had uh, years back with uh, Mary and Alan, which were very rich and rewarding for me um, and Mary's work. Um, that I think Mary and, and her going back to education for continuity and change and, um, and all of her work, there's that, you, you model such an, uh, an open, um, expansive, uh, balanced dialogical outlook that um, is something that I'm especially grateful for um, as a member of this guild. So thank you. Thank you. I think we come to a close of this session. If there's nobody who wants to say something now at this very moment. I then... just wanted to say thank you, Mary, for modeling this. And I might use it in, in educational communal settings. I mean, this is so, that was so therapeutic and it's, it's powerful. I, what got me just to share a little of personal reflection uh, is it could be also in a form of a question how do we sh how do we express gratitude for the brokenness the things in our life that are broken the pieces that are missing or we're trying to put together how do we do that and uh, if you want to sh shed light on that I would be delighted to hear because of time I, I won't say much but I will say that um, gratitude for brokenness is one of the most important forms of gratitude um, that that's where we are able to go deep and where we are able to get to to um, the profundity of gratitude beyond uh, beneath the surface of of what makes us feel good and happy right right you know as a Hasidic and it, man, be it becomes transformative then right as Buber, Buber codes from a Hasidic master that a broken heart is the only whole heart it's a true whole heart something like that yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to thank now Professor Tracy Lamont and you, Abraham Rabinovich, for your presentations that, that kind of were a preparation for the meditation that Mary Elizabeth did with us. And Mary Elizabeth, I thank you so much for winding up our uh, Zoom meeting this moment of the day, the morning or the evening or the afternoon. Thank you very much. And I take home um, from this, the whole uh, Zoom meeting that we should listen to silenced voices and silenced voices of trees, of nature and so on, but also silenced voices in our community. We should try to listen to them. I think we should try to um, take the challenge to uh, make texts that are very difficult for students to read to make them accessible for our students. That's a real challenge. And that's a way to be uh, an ancestor for our students. And I take home how to live in two worlds and to do justice to the difference. Not trying to make one beautiful melting pot and everything is alike, but to do justice to the difference. And I take home that it's very important to sit down now and then and take maybe only 15 seconds to be grateful for our life, for our being a member of Rhea, being colleagues with each other. So much to be grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much all. <laughs>